Coming up on Theatre Talk. What would happen to the theatre were there no professional critics? Well, Pauline Kael said it right, actually. She said, if there weren't critics, we would depend on press agents. From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I am sitting here now with my guest co-host, the wonderful, talented, and very funny Julie Halston. Happy to and be here. We are so honored that our guest is an icon of humor, glamour, and show business, Renee oh, Taylor. Thank you. thank you so much. I'm honored to be here with you well, on Theater Talk. And your show, My Life on a Diet, is opening in New York City at the Theater at St. Clements on 46th Street. It was written and directed by you and your late husband, Joseph Bologna. So oh. this is the New York premiere. We are so thrilled to have you, Renee. Thank you. So we were talking about the fact that I first saw you on Jack Parr uh -huh. back what, in the 60s? 60, yeah. With Jack Parr would just brought you in on 23 times. 23 times she was on talk. in yeah. two years. Yeah. Wow. How'd you get that gig? I auditioned as a singer, and uh, during my audition, I forgot my music, so I started humming, <laughs> and uh, my zipper broke. I was so nervous, and uh, they said, you're hired. And I said, as a hummer or... <laughs> they said, no, it's right. a talker. You're on tonight. I tell the story in my life on a diet, and I was so nervous, I cut my legs shaving before I went on, and um, I spilled water all over me. And he said, y your, your legs are bleeding and your dress is wet. <laughs> and I said to him, just act casual. <laughs> okay, because you were hilarious. Uh -uh. You were hilarious, and clearly the audience just ate you up like a, uh, you know, Thank so you. that's fantastic. As they're still eating you up. Oh. It's so great. Are you excited about doing this? Fantastic. The play, yes, because oh, yes. it's my life through what I was eating. Like Nora <laughs> Ephron remembered what she was wearing. Yes. And I just remember what diet I was on and what everybody <laughs> else was eating. And that's how I look back at my whole life. And I thought if I ate like different movie stars, I would look like them. So whenever I met someone, I'd sit down next to them and notice what they would eat, and then I'd go and eat that. <laughs> it's hopeless, Renee, isn't it? It's hopeless. You keep on the diet just to avoid getting fatter, but it's just some of us are stuck with that. Well, with uh, I was in class with Marilyn Monroe. I <laughs> ate with she ate. Uh, she told me she ate grapes, and so I ate get grapes. But I told her I gained weight. It didn't work with me. But you know, she was a size 12 or something. I mean, by today's standards, by today's standards. Marilyn Monroe. Oh, she, she, she wouldn't get work. Right. You know, they tell her, you know, lose weight or you're, you're out. Mae West. But, uh, oh, no, they no, told no. her, you've got to lose weight. And she said, no, I'm not going to. See, there so you there go. she was. She's the first woman in movies that said, no, right. I'm not going to. Men like me like this. Yeah. Now, how come girls today don't say, no, I'm not going to? Well, it's a whole, it's, it's, it's a whole other, I mean, I don't want to get to the serious, but of course, we didn't have a knowledge about uh, the food technology as we were growing up. And now these yeah. kids, they grow up not eating, <laughs> you know, or, or eating very healthily. Yeah. Who knew from that? Yeah. But now, Renee, a movie you were in, you had a, you've written movies, you've written television plays, started. But one movie that stands out, you had a very small part, but such an important one, The Producers. Uh, how did that, that, you played Ava Braun, how did that come to be? Uh, I was going on for uh, In Love as the standby, and he was in the audience. And um, he said to me the other night, as a matter of fact, I Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks, 45 yeah. years later, he said, did I ever thank you? I said, no. He said, well, thank you. Oh, there and you go. And then he invited me to come in to audition, and he said, I remember your audition. You came in after like 300 girls, and he imitated my audition 45 years later. He remembered my what audition. What was your audition? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was my... <laughs> So you went on for, as Ann an Jackson. understudy for Ann Jackson. Yes. In Murray Shishkal's Love. Love. And you know who else came to see me? 
by accident, George Abbott was in the audience. Oh, for goodness And sake. he wrote me a letter and said, I don't see how anyone could be better. Come to see me tomorrow. And I did, and I got in a Broadway show with what him. What was that? Uh, I was called Agatha Sue, I Love You. Well, okay. Was George Abbott ever on this show? No, we were, no. We, he moved on a little before we started, oh, yeah. Oh, no. oh. Well, anyway. I he, might be old, but I'm not uh, that old. No, he died. He was over 100. Yeah. yeah yes, but anyway, true. at rehearsal, he would send people home uh, if they weren't dressed respectfully. He said, you can't come in the theater with sneakers. He sent somebody home. Oh, oh And when boy. he gave me a direction and I did it well, he would grab me in his arms and waltz me around the stage. Oh, my. Now, now you're, you remind me him grabbing you in his arms and waltzing you around the stage. We recently had Estelle Parsons on this show, and she you told me you studied with Lee Strasberg. Yes. She's a huge spokesperson for the method and for the actor's studio. Patricia Bosworth was here and wrote about her book that some say that uh, Strasberg seemed, that those guys over at the actor's studio seemed a little abusive towards women by today's standards. You have well, any thoughts on he that? He was always very severe with me. I was in his class for eight years. Huh. Three times a week, he was very severe with me. At the beginning, I said, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, criticizing me like that. But then when I saw what he said to Steve McQueen and uh, James Dean, I said, hey, he's right about that. Maybe I'm wrong about Huh. about me and I really a light went on and I really started doing everything that I still hear his voice when I go on stage now and I'm doing comedy I hear his voice well, like relax your shoulders relax your mouth just open yourself up let it happen I hear him mm, interesting were you close to any of those people like Steve McQueen or James Dean or those other I was people hanging around? actually I talk about it in the play I was close to Marilyn I got to be a friends with her. And I wonder about how if she was alive today, maybe she would be on Broadway. Mm. Maybe she would be. Hmm. So you just see that she was a victim of... She was a wonderful actress. Yeah. And they saw a part of her in Hollywood, and that's what they explored. And not the whole thing. And they laughed at her because... But in class, her vulnerability, I was very, very impressed with and her risk taking. I met her in the ladies room. She was so scared. She was putting calamine lotion on her face. That's how nervous she was. Mm. I was just really madly in love with her, yeah. her risk taking. And that's what you do. I mean, yeah. all your life. When did you meet Joseph Bologna, your husband and your writing partner and your producing partner? We had the same manager, and he said, I'm going to introduce you to someone you're going to have a comedy rapport with. And clearly you did. We did. A legendary duo. We never, 1965? Yeah, we never stopped laughing. We got married six months later. We never stopped laughing. And you were able to work together just we on and on. We did three plays and, uh, no, three movies, 22 plays, three on Broadway. How did you write together? Because you wrote a lot together, obviously. Well, I would write the first version and give it to him. Right. And then he would take it and rewrite it and give it back to me, and I'd rewrite it, give it back to him. We kept passing it back and forth. Yeah. But you'd That's, start the ball? I always was the one because I'd say, how about this? <laughs> about everything. About everything. Huh. I was the beginner. Right. At the starter, and he was the finisher. Were there times when he was finishing in a way that you thought wasn't right and that you had to negotiate that? We'd compromise, because we'd negotiate. I'd say, if you give me this line, then I'll go with you to your families on Easter. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the negotiation. I think this sounds fantastic. That's, that's pretty smart, Renee. <laughs> yes, I think this is very smart. <laughs> it was wonderful to see him in the memorandum. Yeah, uh, the, on the Tony Awards. On the this Tony year. Awards. You know, I talk to him every day. I write to him, and he writes back to me in, in a different color pen. And when I saw him up there, for a moment I thought, oh my God, is he dead? <laughs> I thought, they don't know. He's alive. I talk to him every day. Then I realized uh, I'm in denial because my reality is that he's, that he's with me. Mm -hmm. That's my reality. Well, I think he is with you. 
He is with I me. mean, here you are, you're doing the show that you wrote together, yes. that he directed. With me, Was yes. this planned before he passed away, or did you decide, okay, now this is the time for me to, to bring our work into New York? No, and he said, why don't you, you have such a crazy life, why don't you write about it? And I said, oh no, it, my life is in terms of diets. No one will be interested. He said, are you kidding? Everybody's on a diet. Men, women, people who are unsure. Or on insure. Insure. <laughs> um, so he just encouraged me and took me all the way through it. Now there's a concept that in fat shaming that, that very much people are saying, wait a minute, don't discriminate against me because of my weight. And of course, we have the obesity epidemic. But d did you feel that you were discriminated against in this business because of a bigger weight? Yes, Yeah, I was. Can you think of some uh, instance of that that you really stung you? No, I mean, they would say, no, we want a thinner girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, when do you need it by? Right. And they'd say, Tuesday. I said, well, I don't know, maybe two pounds. I don't know. I'd, right. I'd, I'd do it. Yes, weight was a big thing in my, in my life. Yeah. Even for character actresses? No, then when you get older, it really doesn't matter doesn't how matter. heavy you are when, you, when you're over. I say I'm either 85 or 58, one or the other. Now, but you were in The Nanny. Yes. Did they write that part for you, or did you, or did your agents say, "Oh, no, we actually, can't they wanted her. somebody more Presbyterian. They wanted Sheila McRae for the part of the Jewish mother. So Fran just said, "You know what? Come on as a guest and let them discover you." And that's just what happened. They said, "Hey, she'd be okay oh, be a mother," this... and that's how it happened. Isn't that strange? But it happens that way. Yeah, that I is know. what happens. It does. And they do right. usually go, they go, oh, we, we need someone a little waspier. Yeah. They're like, really? Yeah. Hello for the Jewish mother. Well, but it, look what happened. Bruce yeah. Valanche said that he experienced, he said, we need a different type. We're going with Nell Carter. <laughs> you know, what Harvey Feierstein said, when I went backstage at Hairspray, he said, Brene could, should, could take over for me. And they said, no, we want a man. And he said, she could play a man playing a woman. Exactly. So you now is My Life on a Diet, produced by Julian Schlossberg. Schlossberg. And yes. he did It Had to Be You 37 years ago. So he said, every 37 years, we're going to work together. <laughs> well, that's, and now, is this, a, is this a limited run, or is this an extended Six run? weeks. Six weeks. But then you'll be here. I'll be here. You'll be here. And available. And available. And available. That is so wonderful. Thank well, you. I hope you come back because oh, you know, this is our you. last taping of the season. We have to be short, but it is such, again, such a pleasure to meet you. Oh, with. so great. You're yeah. such a wonderful lady. Yay! Joining me is my co-host and friend, Donna Hanover of Arts in the City. Theater Talk has been on the air for 26 years in some form, and our first guest ever was the great critic John Simon, and we are so delighted to have him with us this week. Happy to be here. And joining John Simon is another critic, Matt Windman, who I first met when he was but a student at NYU. He became a drama critic and a lawyer and has written this wonderful book, The Critics Say, in which he did an extensive interview with how many critics, Matt? 57 critics, I think important one among them was John Simon, and that's what brings him here today. And also joining us is Justin Brown, who is now John Simon's co-host on their TV show on RN, multi-platform show on <laughs> RNN, yes. Corner Table, which is every Friday, Justin and John, like Siskel and Ebert, reviewing the shows. Welcome to all, John Simon. I'm so happy you're back. You are still a critic. How many years have you been a drama critic? I don't know. I'm not good at mathematics. All right. <laughs> Some years. I met you in 1991, and you'd been doing it quite a while. Yeah. I, look, I'm almost 100 years old, and I almost remember things from maybe 80 or 70. But beyond that, I don't. But, John, back in, back in the day, you were quite, you were considered to be quite abrasive in some respects. A great writer, but very hard on people. I think that's putting it a little lightly. <laughs> How would you characterize it, Matt? Many of the critics that I interviewed talked about John. Uh, it was almost like a back and forth between them, which is kind of how I wanted 
the book to feel, where almost like it was this imaginary symposium. Although I had interviewed each critic separately, I structured it in such a way that they're kind of bouncing their uh, feedback back and forth. Uh, and a lot of the critics talked about their feelings about John Simon, his legacy, his attitude, and obviously many of them have had different opinions on it, uh, but what I think they did agree on was his fearlessness. They seemed to admire your writing very, very much. They didn't always agree with your assessment or maybe with how ascetic you were, but that brings me to a question. Did you ever consider being such an intellectual and vibrant writer, did you ever consider being a playwright yourself? No, I never did. I don't think you should play. I mean, Bernard Shaw was able to do it, but most of us can be satisfied if they can do a decent job on one side of the fence. Being a, uh, a, both a critic and a playwright is also very dangerous because you risk ceding some of your authority if you were to do a show, and let's say it's terrible, like, then how can you go back the next day and maintain that aura of authority? The thing that's so amazing to me, John, is many people at, at, at your age, you know, you have a couple years on me, would just say, I'm retiring, I'm stopping. But not you. You are compelled to write. You obviously love to write. You do still do it beautifully. I know. that There are two things that keep me going. One is my column, my, my blog. And the other is watching tennis, which I enjoyed enormously. <laughs> now, Justin, yes. how did you come into John Simon's life? Um, funny enough, we met outside of, I think it was Waitress. This was a couple years ago. And the father was playing across the street. And his wife, Pat, introduced us. And I'd always heard. Yes, and you were her, her I student, was her student, Pat Simon at Marymount, um, right? And I had graduated at this point, I believe. And she had introduced me, and I was absolutely fearful so I was like is this man gonna say something that's gonna like set me off as like this queer brown feminist that I am but what ended up happening was we had a wonderful conversation about the father and we went we saw waitress and I get a phone call from Pat and she says oh you and John have really good chemistry and the conversation flowed really naturally and he wasn't you weren't scared of him and he wasn't necessarily intimidated by you, would you consider maybe doing a little demo for this uh, TV show that they want to do for RNN? And I was like, yeah, sure. And so we saw an off-Broadway production at the Atlantic. I can't remember what it was. And then we sat on a stoop and we talked about it. My hair was purple and curly and I had facial hair. It's been a very blossoming identity alongside John, which is kind of ironic when you know John's history. So it's been an interesting, fun journey. Now, what do you mean by that? Yeah, what is my history? Oh, what I mean by that is I think when you Google John Simon, you end up finding all of these comments about like, oh, John is racist or he is sexist or he is misogynist or he's this and he's that. But what I think is really fascinating, and I think it's a conversation that we've started to have a lot more in the past two years or so, is meeting in the middle with people who don't necessarily have the same perspective you have. My philosophy is you gotta find some good in something if somebody made it. But I have a difficult time even thinking about it. And I, wa I wanted this to be good. I wanted this to be good so bad. <laughs> Why? With John and I, we've had moments absolutely behind closed doors and off the record where I've been like, John, you probably shouldn't say that. And he's like, oh, why? And all of a sudden, it's a moment of learning. I think you say wonderful things, but I don't think you should say with John and I. You should say with John and me. <laughs> <laughs> so John and I. <laughs> it's another learning moment for all of us. I guess so. Oh, now, hey, you know, last night, uh, it won't be as people are watching this, but as we're taping this, was the Tony Awards. Yes, it now was. You got me scared of my grammar, John. <laughs> were the Tony Awards, was the Tony Awards. And, of course, the big winner was the band's visit, which is all about meeting in the yes. middle and learning. Did you watch the Tony Awards, John Simon? Well, I, I, for the, perhaps for the first time in my life, I agreed with a lot of things that they were saying. Yes, remarkable. Mm -hmm. I certainly was one of the first person to spot the, the band's visit as being quite a wonderful show. And I hated it. 
Really? Mm -hmm. Which felt like an interesting conversation between us. I'm very militant about my approach to um, certain political topics in theater. Mm -hmm. And I think what's exciting about the band's visit is the score itself being so diverse and culturally pointed in terms of the music, but I didn't I didn't like the way it was put together. I didn't like um, the construction of it as a musical. Well, there's no tap numbers, that's for sure. I know, right? Um, but it's it's the lyrics were bizarre to me. I had a whole issue with it, but... What like, would you have voted for? I probably still would have voted for it. Uh-huh, all right. <laughs> you know, I probably, except I did find SpongeBob more impressive, but that is a very personal personal little situation because I think my I think expectations so. were very low for Spongebob and I was they were met and beyond. But many people thought e Ethan Slater was going to win. I was convinced he was going Tony to Schwer win. Matt, your thoughts on... on oh, uh, actually in terms of best actor I thought it was going to be Joshua Henry. Me too. But uh, I did find it interesting that we all assumed that the band's visit was going to win Best Musical. Mm -hmm. It was really no competition. The band's visit, I think, is exceptionally well put together for what it is, but it doesn't necessarily inspire the same kind of enthusiasm that, say, Dear Evan Hansen or, of course, Hamilton did in recent well, years. Nothing's going to inspire that. Well, yes. <laughs> now, John, you made such an important point in Matt's book about the necessity of having critics, what would, that, what would happen to the theater were there no professional critics? Well, Pauline Kael said it right, actually. She said, if there weren't critics, we would depend on press agents. Mm. <laughs> but but in, uh, one of the things that's quoted in Matt's book is that you never viewed yourself as being a, a representative of the consumer. That wasn't your job, to tell mm -hmm. somebody what was worth their money to see or something. It was more to have a, almost a conversation with the theater community. Well, it's also a conversation with myself because I'm my own most severe critic uh -huh. and I don't let anything pass until I have argued it with myself. Again, we say you're a compulsive writer. You're, you, you, you write every Quickly. day. Quickly. When you get up in the morning, do you say, I'm going to go write? Well, uh, when I get up in the morning, I say, my God, do I have to get dressed again? <laughs> in the morning, I think about breakfast. Do you despair? the direction the theater's taking now? Mm. I've always despaired about it, but somehow it seems to thrive on my despair. John, what do you want your legacy to be? Well, I think Woody Allen said it best. He said that my criticism is the most likely to survive. I agree with him. <laughs> but do you think that your criticism being the most likely to survive is due to the fact that it is so abrasive and People kind of feel like, I remember, I can't remember who this quote is from, but they were talking about you and saying, many times gave positive reviews, but those positive reviews oftentimes were outweighed by the negativity that you had to say. And so people kind of thrive off of that negativity and work and in remembering the negativity. Do you feel like that's a reason why you'd be remembered as opposed to the way that you write? Because I feel the people in this circle have so much respect for you as a critic because of your prose not necessarily because of the negative or positive things that you have to say. No, I think what makes the biggest difference ultimately is your writing. You could be writing about horses or about uh, agriculture. Mm. If you write well enough, it becomes interesting. I agree. Well, Jesse Green said on this here. I grew up reading a lot of critics, some of whom wrote loathsome stuff. John Simon is an example, and I would read that stuff. Some of it virulently, virulently homophobic, and I was a little gay boy, and I still ate it up. I understood so where he was coming writer, yeah. from, and he was such a good writer. He is I a could, good writer. I could put that in, in a context and learn from him, even though I disagreed with him. Here you are, you're working with Justin, who's a person of, uh, I don't want to define you, Justin, <laughs> but, you're, but you're a very contemporary person yes. now in the way you present, in your, mm -hmm. in, you present yourself. So your views have softened about uh, gender fluidity and, uh, well, and, 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 st and states of beauty, have they not? I was never so antagonistic as people paint me out to be. Mm. It's just that people remember something very nasty, or as they see it, nasty, especially if it's witty. I mean, witty always survives, and since it's always something negative, because wit usually doesn't extol, wit usually 
cacavils. So, of course, negative criticism is what remains in people's mind. Mm -hmm. And they forget about all the other things. If you look at one of my collections, there are a lot of positive reviews in there. But those got forgotten. And the, un the antithetic ones remain. So, so there we go. The, the, other, the other thing I want to remain is that I love women. <laughs> and I particularly love beautiful women. And I'm very happy that there's someone called Katrina Lesk. Lank. Lank. Katrina Lank. <laughs> In the book, when you spoke to me, didn't you say that, uh, and you talked about the importance of how you feel looking at beautiful women. Did you say that, uh, I think you said that in a sense, you kind of fall in love with them. Maybe so. Matt Windman, the critics say, Justin Brown, Corner Table, Fridays on RNN, I can't, a wonderful show with you and John Simon, yes. telling it like it is. <laughs> John Simon, the great critic, this is a, thank you so much for gracing our show once again. My pleasure. And Donna Hanover, it has been such a pleasure having you as a co-host. Donna Hanover, who's a correspondent, and I also want to say, viewers, a feminist hero. Yes, she Look is. Look it up. <laughs> and so, thank you, my dear. It's wonderful, darling. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.